Welcome to our new season of the Armenian Studies Program lecture series. It's wonderful to see many familiar faces um, and some not so familiar, so welcome to you as well. Uh, we have what I think is a rich uh, array of mostly lectures, but some films, documentaries as well this year dealing with the theme of the upcoming centennial of both the First World War and um, the commemoration for the genocide. And so I want to acknowledge and thank our generous donors, the Marie, um, Alex and Marie Manoukian Foundation and the Manoukian Simon Foundation, not only for providing us with the kind of financial support that allows us to have these great programs, but really to allow us to invite every year to rejuvenate the Armenian Studies program with new postdocs um, and graduate students and visiting faculty. So uh, I would like to first begin actually by introducing the new members of our Armenian Studies program this year, beginning with our two new postdoctoral fellows, uh, Jeden Ozgul, who's going to be giving the first talk um, today, opening our series. Uh, Alison Vaka, who's not here, who's in Turkey at the moment, but Alison is a graduate student um, who just got her PhD at Near Eastern Studies, working not on this modern period. It's always a, a respite to have somebody work on the medieval world. Um, she works on Anatolia and the Armino Arab um, frontiers um, with the rise of Islam. Our two new graduate students as well, um, we have Wan Tukche Kayal. Could you please get up, Tukche Kayal? Tukche is a student in Near Eastern Studies. Welcome, Tukche. And our second graduate student, Pietro Shakarian, who's in the History Department. Welcome, Pietro, uh, as well. I would also like to um, mention and also welcome two or three new members in our governing board, uh, in our executive committee, Gottfried Hagen from Near Eastern Studies. Gottfried, you have to get up too. <laughs> <laughs> and in our steering committee, Kathleen Canning, chair of the history department. Kathleen, thank you for coming. As well as Tamar Boyajan, who's a new member at MSU, um, does medieval studies, does comparative work on Armenian, Arabic, and Middle um, English literature. So welcome, Tamar, um, as well. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors today for uh, the talk of Jeren Uzgel, uh, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, as well as the Anthropology Department. Jeren Uzgel, um, our first postdoc, who's going to open our series, um, I'm very happy that you're here and you accepted our offer. By the way, we have two women who are postdocs. It wasn't uh, anything that we planned out um, consciously, but it tells you something about Armenian studies sort of coming up to um, the trend. So part of the nationalist story of the establishment of the Tur Turkish Republic is that of the Armenian ge genocide carried out during the first two decades of the 20th century. Violent acts that reflected the identification of true, Turkish, true Turkishness with being a Muslim. One largely overlooked consequence of the genocide was the conversion of many Armenians to Islam. According to Jeren Özgül, these have remained what she calls hidden Armenians, people whose ancestors were known in the local community despite their external similarity to other Turks. Very interestingly, among many descendants of these Christians, there has been a move to convert back to the religion of their ancestors, in great measure because of pressure from the European Union, which Turkey aspired at least for a while to join. I don't know if that's the case right now. But it opened up really the possibility of religious freedom in this form. This deliberate move from membership in the Turkish Muslim majority 
to one that is a religious minority opens up a fascinating uh, array of questions that Jiren Uzgel explores in her dissertation and will discuss today, including what are the images held by the majority of these hidden Armenians? How does the de new demand for a religious choice in a secular state serve to redefine the idea of the Turkish nation? How do the everyday experiences of this minority undergird the legal practices of secularity in the Turkish state? Jelen Özgül has received both her master's degree and her PhD from the City University of New York, working under um, the guidance of Talal Assad. She received her bachelor's degree from Boazici University. She has received the, an array of awards and grants from the Association for the Political and Legal Anthropology Graduate Student Paper Prize for a chapter of her dissertation, as well as a Mellon ACLS dissertation um, competition uh, fellowship. And now a, a Manugyan postdoctoral fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Jiren Özgül. Hi. Um, so I will be um, talking about um, the descendants of the Ottoman Armenians who forcibly converted to uh, Islam uh, during and before genocide. But before that, I just want to thank you, uh, uh, the Armenian Studies Program and also the Department of Anthropology for giving me this great opportunity to be here and to um, uh, you know, share the um, results of my research with you. So, um, I want to first draw your attention to the title of the talk. Um, the talk is mainly about the act of conversion. So conversion, genealogical, religious, and legal, so different aspects of conversion, combined with a claim to Armenianness. Um, so first I want to start with an argument. Conversion is not a simple affair in Turkey. It looks very simple at first sight, um, especially in the legal realm. If you look at it, it's possible to convert from one religion to another. Um, by this, I mean to change the religion column of one's ID yeah, here, just by petitioning the register's office. Uh, although the column noting a person's religion still exists in the Turkish ID cards. Its content is to be decided and changed by the bearer um, after the legal reform uh, in the process of the accession to the EU. So this is an example of um, Turkish ID cards. It's a male ID card, by the way. If it's blue, it's male. If it's pink, it's female. So it's not only your religion is marked there, but also your gender identity. Um, so, and if you just, if you take a closer look at it, on the back side of it, it, this is the older version, now we have the smart IDs, but, or, or we are going to have the smart IDs, but it's the same principle. On the back of it, you have a column indicating your religion. So, for many people, it's Islam. If you don't declare it, usually the, um, the idea was to put Islam there, but now, uh, people just can give, like citizens can just submit a petition to the registrar's office to have Christian, um, Jewish um, written there or just leave it blank. Um, so if you look at it from that way, uh, conversion is really simple. You can just, you know, like change your religion in the state registrar's, uh, registrar's the, 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 the moment you, wa you want it to, to be changed. Yet, it's not an easy matter to convert to Armenianness, particularly the predicaments of a group of converts tell us that it is not easy at all. So beginning with the early 1990s, many Turkish citizens registered as Muslims in the state records started to claim Armenian descent. They petitioned the mid-level courts of Tur Turkey to register themselves as Christians and to adapt Armenian names. This group of people traced their ancestry to Christian Ottoman Armenians who had adopted Islam to avoid annihilation during the massacres 
that culminated in the genocide of 1915. Given that the Turkish state refuses to recognize the genocide, the return conversions of Islamized Armenians, of the descendants of the Islamized Armenians, points to the violence that is still largely unmentionable, unmentionable in Turkey. So um, for th this is an example of one of the people who converted um, um, like 10 years ago, let's say. Um, his name is Miran Pergic, he's pretty famous. Um, and the, 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 the headline of August newspaper, newspaper reads, um, Miran thus broke a taboo by converting back to Armenianness. So he came up and spoke about his Armenian roots, not only spoke about them, but he converted back. So here you can see Miran actually on the right hand side, my right. So, and he's wearing the shabik, so kind of like symbolizing his that he is baptized, you know, like only if you are baptized in the Armenian church, you can just um, wear that um, religious attire. So, and right there, it also reads, the damnedise bende oldum, I became what my grandfather was. Um, so this was a, f a phase I heard a lot not only from Miran, actually, but also from every single main re male return convert during my research. Women had different explanations for their conversion, so they weren't bringing up their grandfathers um, so much. I will come to that. Um, the return conversions, thus, are celebrated as culturally uh, interesting facts and as raising awareness about a heretofore little-known group of people quote-unquote, hidden Armenians. Um, I will also discuss how this term is really disturbing for the group of people, like the hidden, the claim of hiddenness about their ex um, existence. They don't really like it. Um, yet, these return conversions are also understood to be highly political, so not only cultural, but also political. They reveal a history that makes the denial of the Armenian genocide harder for the Turkish state. So therefore, he is breaking a taboo, taboo of the Armenian genocide and talking about um, the existence of the Islamized Armenians in Anatolia. Historians and sociologists have established the conditions for the initial conversion of the Ottoman Armenians. Selim Deringil and also um, recently in a, in a a question uh, of genocide, uh, Sunni and Fatma Megyuchek talked about it extensively. Um, so, what, but I'm not going to talk about the historical aspects of these conversions today. What I'm going to focus, and what I am focusing in my research in general, is the question of how different segments of the society and the state in Turkey react to these return conversions. And also how the claims for Armenianness perceived in Turkey, in contemporary Turkey, and what are the reactions of these uh, perceptions by the descendants of the forcibly uh, Islamized um, Ottoman Armenians. So I'm, I'm going to use this um, like kind of long phrase throughout my um, talk because I, I, one thing I'm trying to do is to refrain from using hidden Armenians, Muslim Armenians, crypto Armenians, all the words that we generally use to um, describe them, but with really um, not so nice connotations. And I will, I will also talk about that. Um, so the Armenians, Armenianness of those seeking conversion is something to be proven, not only in the eyes of the Turkish legal authorities, and I will talk about it in a moment, but also in the eyes of the Armenian Patriarchate, the Turkish public, as well as the Armenian minority in Turkey. These recent claims to Armenianness raise several questions. Who is an Armenian? Who decides who is an Armenian? What qualifies these people, these converts, as converts, as religious converts, right? Um, and moreover, as return converts? 
what is the definition of religious conversion in Turkey? So these questions have ambiguous and conflicting answers. When we start to ask these questions, we realize that the, de the definition of Armenianness, legal, religious, ethnic, and genealogical, so that's the uh, title of my talk, are elusive and uncertain. My talk this afternoon tackles these questions uh, of return around return conversions from multiple shifting angles. So. Um, I aim to offer an ethnographic perspective on the ways in which conversion is defined legally, historically, and politically in Turkey. So instead of, I choose to, uh, instead of presenting a chapter or one article from my research, I choose to combine um, two main arguments I am making uh, in my broader research uh, that kind of summarize the gist of my, uh, my, my research. So the idea of converting back to Armenianness, I argue, one, uh, provide a unique vantage point on the historically fragile separation between religion, ethnicity, and citizenship in Turkey, but not only in Turkey, it also further provides, provides us with questions about the nature of, nature of this relationship between um, again, religion, ethnicity, and citizenship in modern secular nation states. The way I choose to look at these return conversions is through an analysis of the nature of secular governance of minority differences, differences in plural because, you know, it's religious difference, ethnic difference, linguistic difference I'm talking about here, and the notions to which they are discussed in Turkey, tolerance, justice, legal reform, and, of course, genocide recognition. The other main argument of my research is that uh, using examples from uh, everyday lives of the return converts um, in an ethnographic way, let's say, um, helps us to flesh out the fears, suspicions, emotions, beliefs, and imaginaries in Turkey on and around the issue of conversion and Armenianness. Um, so I will start with the big question of secularism, so the first argument, and try to analyze conversion within the secular practices of the Turkish state. Return conversions, again, I argue, is a particular um, vantage point to understand the crisis of, crisis of minority recognition in the heart of Turkish secularism. I argue that the return conversions of the descendants of the forcibly Islamized Armenians constitute a double conversion. Ethnic Armenians converting to their ancestors' religion in the pre predominantly Muslim Turkey marks a conversion from um, Islam to Christianity, but at the same time, it's also a conversion from, a from the majority status to that of a status of a religious minority. So double conversion in the sense of conversion from citizenship, the unmarked subject of the modern state, to the marked um, status of a recognized minority. Um, so when I asked, for example, a lawyer who takes the um, cases of um, the return converts um, or who represented converting Armenians, why well, it was important for, um, for, for them to adapt, let's say, Armenian names, um, he answered that a Muslim name conveys the assumption that the person who carries it is a Muslim. Right? So hence, he continued, the main aim in such name change cases is to introduce the convert to the public as an Armenian. So name change and change of religion in the ID cards combined with baptism in the Armenian church constitutes conversion to Armenianness, not only the petition that you give to the uh, registrar to, to change, your, change the religious column in your ID card. Um, so this, this fact, I argue, is part of the bigger context of the nation states and the 
the problem of secularism in today's world. With the emergence of the modern nation state, religion assumed an individual silence that is um, importance, sorry, that is different from its former definition in the empire, let's say in the world empires, as communal belonging. This transformation of its meaning resulted in the emergence of the concept of religious minority as citizens with different religious identities compared to the ma majority, you know, like in a, in a given state. Because of their difference, religious minorities were also granted rights by uh, international uh, agreements and also national constitutions. Religion, in the sense of a certain religious denomination, became part of a minority identity, not only part, but the essential part of the minority identity. As critical scholars of secularism has powerful, powerfully shown, secularism is not a political doctrine separating religious and political uh, from each other, but rather a set of legal and political practices of statecraft. The foundation of secular Turkey also rests on a religiously homogeneous understanding of citizenship that is called you know, Turkish, Turkish secularism. But um, Turkish nationalism also attempted to create a nation of Turks from Muslims that has kept religious minorities outside of the national unity, no matter how well integrated or assimilated the members of the minority have been. This condition of homogeneity creates a specific kind of secularism in Turkey where the religious majority is equated with the national majority at the same time. Um, far from being disinterested in the religious organization of minority communities, the secular Turkish state also regulated minority religious in institutions the way they, and also minority religion uh, the way it can be experienced, known, interpreted, and represented. Uh, Amir Mufti and Sabah Mahmoud, for example, asserted that the rhetoric of protecting minority differences in terms of religion in secular liberal states mask a central crisis of state secularism. Others also argued that it also works to further exclude religious minorities. Um, one major argument for secularism is that by, by, by restraining majority religion, it provides, provides minorities with equal rights of modern citizenship, including freedom of religion. On the other hand, contrary to this, I argue that secularism has not simply regulated the majority religion, let's say Islam in Turkey, but also has altered, altered the very conditions under which the minority religions are represented and governed. Um, so I will give a couple of examples from my research um, to make, so, so to, to, to further my argument and also uh, concretize it like in, in terms of uh, ethnographic examples. And needless to say, all the names you are going to hear are the real names of the people that I talk to. So in, in terms of um, protecting their um, privacy and safe, safety, I am using, uh, you know, like pseudonyms. But um, I only use the real names when their stories are published in newspapers, like Miran Perkic, for example. So, um, so I started to conduct my first interview with an aim to understand how this official stance of the Turkish state on the genocide and public anxi anxiety about the treacherous Armenians translates into individual experiences of exclusion and struggle for the descendants of the Islamized Armenians. Um, my first interview was with Sarkis Bey in the house of an elderly Armenian couple. Um, Sarkis Bey was in his late 40s and has moved to Istanbul a couple of years ago. He told me that he had struggled to make the decision to convert back to his ancestors' religion. And subsequently, he changed the religious column in his ID card and got baptized. He also changed his Turkish name to an Armenian one, Sarkis. 
um, I was asking my questions about his struggles to get an Armenian name, his baptism in the Armenian church, and the registration of his children in the Armenian schools. But all of a sudden, the husband, um, the host of the um, you know, like, uh, apartment that we were in, uh, who was in his late 60s, I guess, um, and who had been listening to us from a distance for some time, interrupted Sarkis Bey. In a markedly angry tone, he stated, quote, our surname was Derderian. It means son of a priest, Derderian. My grandfather was a priest back in our hometown in Malatya, in the Ottoman Empire. He studied in Jerusalem, so he was a very important person in the vicinity. Then Mustafa Kemal came, and my grandfather took the surname Kavak, which is the name of a tree. Turks did, this, did similar things. When the regist registrar saw a bird in a nearby tree, he said, I'm going to give you that bird's name, and they accepted it. They took new names in the new republic. Likewise, the registrar did not register Derderian as our family name. He was right. Why should I insist on an Armenian name, which means son of a priest? We joined the republic, right? So now we are part of it. Why the need to be different? So he was talking to me at that point, and then he turned to Sarkis Bey. Why are you trying to be different? The state, the law, treat us as equal. So what struggle are you talking about? There is no need to struggle. The Muslim and the Christian are the same in this country. There are laws and they work very well. So we are very comfortable. No need to change names or religion since there is no difference between Armenians and Turks in this country. There is no discrimination. The law protects us, us all. So is Sarkis Bey's conversion was a meaningless fantasy, and here I'm quoting uh, Gori Vishwanathan's um, words on conversion, a meaningless fantasy rendered as such by the equality claims of the Turkish citizenship. Thus his claim to Armenianness have no resonance for the modern Turkish citizen, including an Armenian minority. Uh, much social scientific research on minorities in Turkey operates on the basis of a categorical separation of the majority from the minority population, such as Turks versus Armenians. However, this separa separation proves highly problematic with regard to the return converts placed in the political and cultural registers of everyday life in Turkey. Um, as exemplified by the vignette I just, I just talked about. Um, if minority difference is defined by religion, then how do we explain the interaction between, and it's, if it's protected uh, by the laws, how do we explain this interaction by my, my host and my informant, and also the feelings of my informant, uh, the need for struggle to convert back? So Gori Vishwanathan argues that perception of conversion is a special secular fear that disrupts the drama of citizenship in nation states by posing a radical threat to the trajectory of nationhood. If the most prominent function of secular citizenship is the imposition of fixed unalterable identities to the formerly distinct populations of inherited from other political regimes like multi-ethnic, multi-religious empires uh, in a nation state, then as Vishwanathan argues, uh, and quote, by undoing the concept of fixed un unalterable identities, conversion unsettles the boundaries by which selfhood, citizenship, nationhood, and community are defined. Turkish Kemalist secular nationalism adds to this drama of citizenship by controlling both, both majority and minority religions with the ID cards as we uh, already saw, but the practices are not of course limited, the controlling practices are of course not limited to the religious column in ID cards. 
uh, as Esra Özürek, for example, explains, in its Turkish manifestation, secularism functions as a statecraft aiming to homogenize and ideologically control the population. Therefore, conversion in Turkey undo un undoes fixed identities such as Muslim, Armenian, but more importantly, it unravels nationalist ideological fixed pairings such as Turkish Muslim and Armenian Christian. In her analysis of the campaign against Christian miss missionaries and Turkish Christians in Turkey, again, Özürek emphasizes the centrality of these fixed pairings for the Turkish national secularism. And she asks, why is it difficult for Turkish secular nationalists to accept that one can be a Turk and a Christian at the same time. So following her, I also want to ask a similar question. So why is it so difficult to accept not only for Turkish secular nationalists, but also you know, like some members of the Armenian community or the wider public of, of Turkey to accept that one can live as a Muslim and an Armenian at the same time and want to convert at some point in his or her life uh, back to Armenianness. So what is the big deal about it? Um, and I will give another example from my research here to further elaborate this point um, and give another basically aspect, an example, what motivates conversion back to Armenianness. Um, it's the story of Jakub, um, a young man around my age. Um, so I visited Jakub at the small jewelry store where he worked um, as one of two salespeople. During our conversations, he mentioned several times his previous life as a devout Muslim. Before learning about his family's Armenian roots, he had been the follower of a sheikh, of a um, Muslim teacher of religion, let's say. He was attending the sheikh's lectures as part of his group of stu uh, stu students. Yaqub never skipped one rekah, you know, the prescribed prayer moments of his namaz, he told me, as he clarified what his pious observance of Muslim rituals consisted of. After his mother expanded the family's Armenian roots, he had to, he had to end his Islamic studies. It wasn't his choice, though. He wanted to continue. However, his sheikh refused to have him as a discipline. He said, people won't leave you alone. You cannot live as a pious Muslim with your Armenianness known. You have to leave our order. And unquote. In, in this detailed exp expl explanation for his fluctuations between two identities, it becomes clear that he wanted to continue living as a practicing pious Muslim, but was unable to do so because of the revelation of his ethnicity to his sheikh and to his fellow, uh, fellow students in the same group. For Yaqub, conversion to Armenianness came to mean first and foremost, foremost conversion to Christianity. His knowledge about his roots caused a rupture in terms of ethnic belonging, but also uh, in terms of his understanding of religion and religious belonging. His conversion aimed to reconcile his piety with his new, old, Armenian, ethnic, religious identity. Today, Yaqub is still a pious person. He goes to church every Sunday and on important days following his baptism. Um, yet, other, for other Armenians, uh, conversion is a first name they want to have and has nothing to do with Christianity. Um, so I will now give an example of a court case um, from 2007. So a plaintiff petitioned the civil court in Beyoğlu, in a uh, district in Istanbul, stating that in the civil registers, Kütükte, his name was Mehmet. So a Muslim Turkish name, but that he had converted to Christianity between four and five months prior. So he wished to take the name he was given at his baptism, Agop, 
an unmistakably Armenian name uh, as his first name. The petition was boilerplate, resembling many petitions submitted to the legal courts. Um, however, his lawyer was determined to bring up the historical and political aspects of her client's name change request. In her petition to the court, she argued, quote, the village where the plaintiff was born and grew up was originally an Armenian village located in the eastern Anatolia that converted to Islam. However, the Armenians living there never lost their Armenian Christian identities. Recently, the plaintiff converted from Islam to Christianity to go, go back to his own religion and register his religion as Christian with the state's authorities." Unquote. The emergence of Islamized Armenians in the courts triggered legal sanctioned resentment vis-a-vis -vis the claims of Armenians about the violent fate of their ancestors. As another lawyer who took many name change cases of Armenians related to me, name change in these cases is a way to confront the state. The conversion of Armenians back to their ancestors' religion, which implicitly delves around this forbidden mentioning of genocide, is thus perceived as a threat to the integrity of the Turkish state. Yet, if the political connotations of these name change cases and the contested history of the fate of their ancestors is one structural aspect of the debate in the legal realm, then a second aspect that raised in these court cases is the tension between the liberal individual's notion of religious difference and communal belonging. In the courts, Turkish citizens can argue for religious rights as individual Christian converts, especially after the legal reforms that uh, came into existence in the accession process to the EU, but not as Armenians returning to their ancestors' religion. The cases of Armenians applying for a name change and the alternative definitions of religion as suggested by these return conversions, delink conversion from individual belief and politicizes religion. Yet this fact is not limited with the Turkish nation state's context. In the shift from pre-modern to modern forms of statecraft, the definition of religion changed from a matter of communal belonging to the individual right to belief. As Talal Assad argues, the dissemination of the individual believer as a universal concept was part of the globalizing power of the behaviors, knowledges, sensibilities, and political arrangements that have come to comprise, comprise the, the secular. I argue that the name and religion change cases of the converted Armenians have instigated a different political challenge to the dominant definitions of religion enforced by the secular Turkish state. In the court case I discussed above, we can see the definition of religion as a category that's more complicated than simply an indicator of belief, while at the same time still maintain, maintaining ties to the pre-secular definition of religion as communal belonging. Um, so here I want to talk more about conversion as a subversive um, act um, towards state power. Descendants of the forcibly Islamized Armenians make their decisions to convert in the midst of these discussions around the smoking gun in the archives on the genocide and the wider minority regime of Turkish secularism. Yet, their decision to convert back and go to Armenianness goes back uh, beyond the context of secular anxieties and the discussions around the Armenian genocide. It is also a personal decision with political, moral and emotional consequences. The decision to convert, I argue, is not the result of an irresistible force arising from having an essentially Armenian identity, as it's often assumed. The complex and multi-layered emotional factors, rational justifications, workings of the law, and governance of minority difference that are involved in the decision to convert back are what I want to explore in this talk. News of converts emerged at a time when the homogenization of the Turkish nation was assumed to have completed. Not surprisingly, the existence of converts within the national body politic was a threat to the purported stability and credibility of fixed identities of majority and minority in Turkey. 
clearly the existence of Armenian converts blurs fix, fixed pairings. Furthermore, it heightens the public anxiety that centers on those who do not fit into the publicly recognizable personality of the nation. The unmarked converts, and maybe that's what we mean by hidden, unmarked, right, um, who supposedly feign to be a part of the Turkish majority, are therefore often accused of working against the interests of the Turkish nation. Converts are often accused of operating in the midst of an assumed homogeneous Turkish nation. Yet the biggest imagined threat comes from the non-Muslims who pose as a Muslim and a Turk, or a Turk who becomes a, a non-Muslim, for they are, as Mary Douglas argues, matter out of place. They do not conform to the fixed pairings. This condition makes them dirty and dangerous for the national body, capable of the biggest treacheries. The main issue is not that hidden Armenians are in fact Armenians. Rather, they are hiding their origins and thus destabilizing the categories fixed by the nation state. We can trace the examples of deceptiveness of Armenians to the 1980s. In, t in Turkey, uh, Armenian conversions are equated as being hidden and also um, deceiving the nation. So here I show a um, newspaper clipping um, which says basically the terrorist who infiltrated into Turkey from the southern border was captured dead. It was identified that he was circumcised. It was conceived that the raid was designed by the leaders of a separatist and destructive Marxist terror, orga terror organization outside the country and ex executed with the help of two neighboring nations. The clothes of the terrorists were made in France. So as we can see from uh, the text of the news, uh, the illusions revolve around the notion that Armenian converts living an, as Muslims are the quintessential traitors, accomplices in every attack against Turkey. The most prominent paradox in the life of the returned converts I interviewed during my research is the way in which they came to be known as hidden Armenians in Turkey. At first glance, it seems an issue of classification, a group of Muslims whose grandparents were Armenian. This term is one of many terms by which this community is common, commonly described. Others being Muslim Armenians, crypto Armenians, uh, Islamized Armenians. However, all these terms have significant limitations and problems. My informants expressed resentment against many of these descriptions, especially the crypto and hidden denominations, for masking hatred and suspicion against individuals with Armenian roots who lived as Muslims. The term, hidden Armenian, according to their accounts, is a highly problematic term, suggesting that they are cowards or traitors who have, in their own terms, something to hide. Hiding is a category that overrides other possible definitions for the forcefully Islamized Armenians in Turkey today. I explored the, the ways in which the hidden Armenian, quote unquote, captured Turkish nationalist imagination. Specifically, I focus on ac accusations uh, against hidden Armenians, the political consequences of being hidden and being converted, alleged conspiracies, the terror they provoke, and the social risks they embody. I analyze in my research hide hiding and converts presence in the nations systematically throughout the history of the Turkish Republic. This raises a number of challenging questions which I want to, with which I want to conclude this talk. What does it mean to be a hidden Armenian? How does this condition of being hidden, quote unquote, manifest itself? What types of dangers does hiding evoke in the national imaginary? who decides the parameter, parameters of hiding? What are the legal structures that guarantee the continuation of hiding in Turkey? So instead of concluding remarks, remarks, I want to ask again, who are the descendants of the forcibly Islamized Armenians? Historical evidence shows that conversion is a vital strategy for survival in the face of mass violence. 
be that as it may, accounts of return conversions also uncover the everyday violence of the exclusion that converts experience in regard to both majority and minority communities. However, their voices, male and female, are yet to be heard in the shadow of an unutterable violence.